Hello, good morning, and welcome back to the fish locker out on the shore. I'm on a rock mark at the moment. I'm going to be fishing two different rock marks. Right now, as you can probably see, we are just coming down to low water. One of these marks that I'm going to be fishing fishes better over low water, one of them fishes better over high water. So I'm going to try and fish the whole tide over two marks. And the target today is going to be Ras. Ras or possibly anything else that I can find. The reason that I'm saying that is because I've literally I've just rocked up to the mark and this is what I've just seen on one of the rocks. It's a schooly bass. So I don't know if the seals had hold of that and then the seagulls had finished it off. But yeah, it's a good sign. I'm going to be fishing right down in amongst all of the kelpie rough stuff like that. At the moment I'm going to be fishing vertically or just a little bit of a ways out and I'm going to be fishing with a light spinning rod. And then later on as I'm going to be fishing when the tide's rising I'm going to be fishing with stronger gear at distance. I'll explain that as I do it. I'm excited just the clarity of the water it looks fantastic I don't know how well you can see it but yeah. yeah it looks brilliant to me. I'll get all my rigs set up and I'll show you when before I start fishing. This is quite funny here. I must have picked this guy up on the walk down. On the walk down through all the bracken and the bushes, this guy must have grabbed hold of me. That is a furry caterpillar. I'll take him back up there and I'll stick him where all the bracken is. Little hitchhiker. Right, I'm pretty much set up now. All I'm using is, this is my Pen Conflict Inshore and this is the 30 gram version. I've got a 30 and a 50. I've got a 50 first and I loved it that much. I thought I'd get a 30 as well. And I, a Pen Slammer 4, four, four blah, blah, blah. a Pen Slammer 4, four and a half thousand. 25 pound braid, 30 pound fluoro. The reason why I've got quite a heavy leader on this time is because I'm going to be fishing right in amongst the rough stuff. Just a strong swivel. Now the rigs that this type of fishing, you're in amongst all the rough stuff, you're, you're fishing for a hard fighting fish that's going to find snags, you are going to lose gear, it's inevitable. This is, this is the type of fishing where you want to be using like your older, <laughs> your older terminal tackle because you're going to be losing bits of it, it's, it's, that happens. So all I've got is I've just got all my little battered leads, you can use stones, bolts, anything like that. I just have a little bag of a mixture of ones, twos and threes. And the rigs that I'm going to be using are really simple. I just knock these up. In fact, I have some videos on how to make these rigs. My racing rigs, these at the moment are just two hook racing rigs. And I'm going to be using size two chino hooks and a couple of little floaty beads. The reason why I put little beads on the end, I'm keeping it in the bag at the moment because it's quite windy. The reason why I keep little beads towards the end of the hook is because you will get bigger rasts sometimes. And these smaller hooks, to stop them from swallowing them, Sometimes the beads at the end, it stops them from getting them too far inside their mouth. <laughs> I've said that now, the first one I hook, it's going to be right down its throat in it. But yeah, we'll do what we can. Uh, very simple, because like I said, you're going to be losing gear. So the more components and the more knots and the more bits and pieces that you put inside of these rigs, the more time it takes you to make them, the more stuff you're going to lose when you lose them. That's it. And the bait that I'm using is just some fresh ragworm. You can use all sorts for catching wrasse. Prawns, crabs, limpets, little bits of cockles, mussels, but I particularly like ragworm. And all you do is, where's, where's my tackle? Where's my gear? Come on, John, get your life in order. Take one of your ragworms, start at the head end, if you're unsure which is the head end, hold it for a second. It'll bite you and you'll know where its head end is. <laughs> and you just thread it up the hook. Now, you don't want to go mad. Just get it so that its head is above, above the eye of the hook. Because, like that. Because you want a bit of the tail out to wriggle around. I'll bait up the other side and then attach a lead and then we'll get fishing. All right, there we are. We're all set up and ready to fish. So all I've done is I've just connected, connected my rig to my strong swivel, 
ragworm and a couple of beads, ragworm and a couple of beads, and this at the moment is a one and a half ounce lead. Now I'm going to be fishing pretty much straight up and down. The rocks off the end of the area, it is quite deep and it's vertical. I'm going to be fishing in amongst all the kelp because this is where the rats live. So you need to be fishing with a very tight drag because these rats, they give a proper bite and as soon as they feel the hook, they'll just bolt for the nearest hole. They'll snag you up straight away. So, yeah, that's probably enough. <laughs> I'm sure if you hear me sniffing, it's because of hay fever. Some fields up around here that must have rape growing in them because I sneezed about 15 times on the way down here. I'll take you to the edge there and we'll see if we can't show you what we're doing. First one, that is a cork ring ras. Now that's a proper one. That is a lovely ballon ras. Gonna have to walk it down there though. <laughs> fish that that right there is what we're after what a beauty I don't know if you saw the bite there properly, but even though I had this drag really, really tight, as soon as it struck and I lifted into it, it was straight in for the snags. I had to properly like pump and wind and, and pull it up out there, and even then it just got into the kelp. But yeah, this is a lovely fish. I'll just go out here in a rock pool. Put the rod down there. Just see the bait and hook there. Well, that's a stunning wrasse. Got some lovely colours underneath there, aren't they? This one, they come in all different colours. No two are ever the same. This one is orange and green. I don't know if you can... The top of its back has got an awful lot of green in it, whereas underside it's all gold and ginger. And it's got a proper set of like rubber lips. Don't know if you can see. But I'll um, take the hook out. Hold still. Yeah. That's all it was. Just that was a size one cox and roll chino hook. Strong and sharp. Oh, back in the rock pole. I'll leave it here in the rock pole and I'll get a photo of it. But yeah, that's that's all it was. You saw everything from start to finish. Oh, it snarled me up a little bit. That's a rig look. And a fish like that could have very easily swallowed this, swallowed this little tiny hook. But like I said, them little beads just hooked it in the corner of the mouth. Perfect. Get another ragworm on and we'll get back down now ras they're not like other fish some fish if you fish in an area and you cause like a lot of disturbance in that swim the other fish they'll bolt they'll be gone you'll never see them again so you have to keep moving ras 
they don't mind a little bit of commotion. They, in fact, they're that inquisitive that if you've caught a ras in an area and it's caused like a lot of splashing and a lot of racks in about, another ras will be straight in there because they'll be thinking, oh, what's going on there like? So I could go and drop straight back down in that same place and catch another one. You will find them all of different colours, different sizes. Usually they are quite territorial. There will be one monster and he's like the king of the reef. He's the king of that territory. Now I don't think he's quite big enough to be the top dog. I'm expecting there could be, we could get a four pound fish today. He's, he's over two but I don't think he'll go to three. Lovely looking fish though. Uh, that is a ballon wrasse. The first one I caught was a, cook, was a cork wing wrasse. You get three or four different types. You'll get ballon wrasse which are the biggest, cuckoo wrasse which the males are stunning. I'll, I'll put a picture in here. We're, we're unlikely to catch those because you generally catch them in a little bit deeper water but like orange and blue and the females are all peach and cork wing wrasse. You do get uh, gold cine wrasse and race guild wrasse and uh, rock cook wrasse but they're considered to be mini species, they're tiny. Today we're going for balance, we're going for the big dogs. Straight back down. there to play that in and this one's only a small one it's a lovely looking golden one isn't it See? even the small ones really fight don't they that's on. oh it's in the snags See what I mean? You've got to be really, really quick on them. Ginger one. Rats aren't known as being a good eating fish, but they are really important for the ecosystem. They uh, they clean up a lot of a lot of parasites, like a lot of lice. Um, they've been fished fished commercially quite a bit lately because the uh, Scottish salmon farms use them as cleaner rats. Put them inside the pens and they eat all the lice off the off the salmon. A really slow growing fish as well. So one of these, one of these real big, like a donkey wrasse, like four or five pounders. That'll be an old fish. They, uh, they feed on everything, all the little tiny bits of crustaceans, crabs, shrimps, lice, little sand fleas, everything like that can get hold of. Even when they get bigger, they do also eat fish. Some of the better, some of the really big ones that I've caught on the reefs offshore, they've been caught on live sand eel. You, uh, you do catch them on lures as well. One of the real big ones though, I wonder if their diet changes as they get a little bit older. You know, as they get as they get to be a bigger fish, I wonder if they, they become more predatory. I've been fishing for about three quarters of an hour now. I'll give it another half an hour for the tide to change. Yeah, time to go up to the van. Go and get the other rods out and go to the other mark. Funnily enough, days like today when it is lovely sunshine and clear water aren't the best days for fishing for wrasse. I mean, I can see the seabird here. I'm fishing in about 12 feet of water, and I can see every rock and every little, little tiny fish swimming about down there. It's better when there's either a little bit of cloud cover or a little bit of murk in the water. Just gives the fish a little bit more confidence. Oh. Yeah, corkwing wrasse. Lovely, pretty wrasse, but not massive. <laughs> here you are, look. Stunning looking little fish. They get um, like a lovely blue green. Cool, they're all up underneath here. Ah. And he's released himself. 
I don't know if you can see now as soon as the tides turned they start to flood back in we're starting to get a little bit of swell yeah rats love kelp kelp and rocks are little places for them to hide so areas like this where it's sheer rock straight down to being like 10 12 feet and covered in kelp these are perfect for them oh, oh no oh, a little balloon rust different colour again this time completely brown yeah I was fishing right below my feet and I was getting tiny tiny corkering rust bites you can tell the difference when you when you feel them straight into kelp size 2 chino hooks put slightly smaller hooks on this rig just because I figured I was getting more bites from corking rust, so I wanted to hook up with the smaller ones. I would rather catch a smaller fish than not catch any fish. Yeah, just getting little corking rust bites. And that guy must have been attracted by the commotion. I've got a couple of little scraps of bait, we'll try that one more time and then we'll move. All I'm doing here is I'm just bouncing the lead along the seabed. Just searching out because there we go, I found one. Because it's not flat sea, but it's all boulders on top of boulders. I was just bouncing around until I found like a little tiny cave. I have caught a few other species doing this before as well. Caught three bearded rocklings, I've caught scorpion fish, a little pouting. Yep, there we go. Oh no, don't you dare. This is a female corkwing wrasse. She's just popped herself off the hook. Just popped herself off the hook. This female here, you'll see that she's not got the bright blue and orange and green that the male has. This, this blue part here by her anal fin, that shows that she's a breeding age and a false eye on her tail. The corkwing rust. Yeah, we fished about an hour and a half down over low water. Uh, I don't know how many fish we've had, but we're going to go back to the van, get the bigger rods, and we're going to fish a mark over high water now. Right, <laughs> as always happens, I've got to a new mark. I'm going to fish it with the rising tide now. You can possibly see a couple of areas around me here. I'm fishing into areas of rock and kelp. The sand out at distance, and there's rocks in close. Keep an eye on that rod behind me if you can. I'll leave it up there. Yeah, I like to get my rods out before I start setting anything else up. I set the rods up, two rods out in two different places, turn around to turn the camera on, switch back. So I have oh. Oh. this is why I like to bring one of these tubs. Not only is it somewhere that I can wash my hands, but also if I catch a fish like this, which is a warm day today, I can bring it straight out of the water, put it in a pail of water like this, it can calm down while I sort my life out. Now, we are getting a bite on the road. Um, I am trialling out a new... I am trialling out a new microphone today. I've got one on here. So if the audio is slightly different, it's because I'm just getting used to the new setup. I don't like change. Anyway, yeah, we'll go be quick. This fish is a very green and brown one. Just exactly the same rig as what I was using before. I hadn't even had a chance to switch over to the new rigs yet. A little hook, a couple of beads, a bit of ragworm. And it's found me, like, as the tide starts to flood in, as we start getting a little bit more water over these rocks, I am hoping the fish are going to start to get a bit bigger. This is going to be like the average stamp, about a pound. But they do, and they hopefully will get bigger. Get you down here. Like I've said before, it is really tight drag fishing. Fishing to a tight rod tip, 
So the line to the rod tip is tight, so you'll show a bite straight away. And as soon as you get a proper bite, you'll get little tiny pecking bites like that, which will be corkering wrasse. As soon as you get like a proper bite, proper ballon wrasse bite, you need to get on it. Because as soon as they feel any resistance at that hook there, they'll be straight down. Straight down, wrapped around some kelp, underneath a rock, any type of crevice. These guys live right in the snaggy stuff. As soon as they feel a hook, they want to be back in it. Straight down, no messing about. I'm going to really quickly talk you through the rigs. The rigs that I was using before, well, I've just had that fish on. It's just a two hook rig like that, with the lead straight into the rig. Now I'm fishing these almost vertically. So I'm able to bounce the lead and keep it out of the snags. If I was going to cast this at distance, chances are the rocks are going to be like that and the hooks and the leads are going to get stuck into it because I'm dragging it at an angle. I'm going to snag up. These are my racing rigs. These ones. I have a video on the Fish Locker Workshop channel that I'll tag into the description of here. I'll put a link in this video as well, actually, showing you how to make these. They're really, really simple. And they have, at the bottom of them, they have what's called a canny length. Just a little tiny hook. And this builds in a weak link to my trace. And all I've got with my leads is I've just got some 10 pound fluoro. This is 40 pound. Now, you don't have to use 40 pound. You can use lighter, you can use heavier, you can use whatever you want. It was just, it was some spare line that I had left over. A couple of floating beads a strong hook and all I'm going to do is I'm going to tie this this lighter fluoro use fluoro, you use mono, you use whatever you want tie it to this canny link hook and this builds in a rotten bottom like that so when I'm going to cast what I'll do is I'll hook on the lead like that and then when it hits the seabed that should pop off and then I'm fishing onto a lighter length so if this lead gets stuck in the rocks anywhere, hopefully this will snap and I'll still get my rig back and all I've lost is a lead. It's a rotten bottom setup, that's what it's called. Because I'm fishing right into the rough snaggy stuff, that's what I'm going to be using. So I'll show you when it's all baited up and ready to cast out. But the reason why I'm using this is because I'm going to be fishing these at distance into those rocks. And you've got more chance of snagging up. The other ones before when I was fishing them straight up and down, Got less chance of snagging up on the lead. There you are. So I've head hooked a bunch of ragworm there. Hook that up and connect that to my main line. That's ready to cast out. Now these beads here, they do add a little bit of buoyancy, so it should keep it up. But also, it's a little bit of attraction. All these ragworm are going to be flapping around. What wouldn't want to eat that? Let's get it cast out. I'm not casting these far. I'm only going to maybe 60 yards at the back of these rocks just so it can drop down into the kelp behind them. Because the areas of kelp that I can see at distance, I don't know what they're like. I know where the rocks are in front of me, I know how big they are. But the other patches that I can see, it might be nothing. But it needs to be a bit of feature to hold the fish. So all I'm doing is I'll cast into the sand and trot it back towards the rock until I start to feel some resistance where it's hit the seaweed. And we're going to rod rest. I'm using slightly bigger hooks here, I'm using one o's. Because the fish that I'm going for, I'm not going for the cork rings, I'm not going for the little wrasse. I want the big ones. In fact, at the moment I'm using ragworm. In a bit, when the tide's risen up a little bit more, the, these balance will move in as the tide floods. They'll come in this way as the tide's flooding in. We've still got probably a good two and a half metres of tide to come in yet. So in an hour or so's time, I'm going to start knocking some peeler crab baits out. It's absolutely roasting today. Struggling to keep this base alive. Keep it in a tub in the shade. This is, this is the area down here what I'm fishing into. You can, see, you can see where all the big rocks are. 
a little bit of seaweed at the back of it. I'm putting the casts to the back of them rocks so it will run up behind them. And when the tide's coming, I'm going to fish into these gullies. Looks lovely, doesn't it? I think I might have to come down here with wetsuit. By, by moving them, by moving the baits like this, there's an awful lot of um, suspended weed in some areas, and I don't want the, I don't want the bait and the weight to be hiding underneath like a little piece of sea lettuce or a little piece of dulse or something like that. So by moving it a little bit, it creates like a, a disturbance in the water, and fish kind of hone in on that. The same principle when you're uh, flounder fishing longer or place fishing. I thought this might be what it was but I was hoping I was going to escape without them. Now if I can, if I can get him onto dry land that is a big one. Let's see if I can go down and grab him. That is not what I'm after. Hooked him fair and square in the mouth, like. <laughs> Hoofing great male spider crab. Look at the size of his claws. He'd be a decent size to catch him in crab pots. Two bites now where I thought it was spider crabs. When it just gives a little bit and then it just pulls over. And it's just heavy. When you lift it, it's just heavy. There's no fight in it. Obviously, you're just pulling a spider crab up. Stick another peeler crab. I've got a peeler crab bait out on that right hand side, Rod. I'm going to stick another peeler crab bait on that one. Just. I can't believe we're not catching more fish. It's just crazy. Crazy. I suppose that's fishing for you, and it? it looks, it looks lovely. But I, I know in my own mind, we would be better off. We would be catching more fish if it was overcast and if the water was a little bit cloudier, because the water is literally crystal clear. <laughs> that was just, that was just typical. That the other microphone setup that I've been using for the for the beginning of this video. Batteries died, so I was busy, <laughs> busy changing it all around. Turn around, Rod was going. Just, just, just. What can you do? But the good thing about that being that we're back to the standard mic, is I can strip off a couple of these layers because I am sweating. Let that be a lesson to check your drag. I backed the drag off to be able to let a little bit of line away. Struck into it and just pulled line off the <laughs> pulled line off the rail instead of setting hook into the fish. Every day is a school day. Today I'm learning that I'm an idiot. <laughs> rod out the rod holder. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was one of those when you turn your back and the rod's leaving the rod holder. Uh, I was just starting to despair. I was thinking, oh god, I'm gonna have to pull some out of the bag here because this just ain't working. Mix around the 
put two new fresh baits out, two different areas. I thought I'm going to get my little spinning rod out again and I'm going to try and put out some smaller baits just to try and find something, something to keep me occupied, something to get some fish moving through. Anyway, <laughs> put the rod down, turn round, just heard this rattle, turn round, the rod must just go. Yeah, that's, that's the best fish so far today, that. Just get another bait sorted and sent back out and then I'll show you that fish and unhook it. But yeah, just the same as what you have been doing. Ragworm. There's a rock pipit. Don't know if you can hear it. I think it's a rock pipit. Just sounds like a squeaky wheel. Must have a nest up somewhere around here because it's, it's been squeaking at me all morning. Calm down in there, yo. There we go. We'll have a look for that in a minute. But I'm praying that this means that the fish are coming on the feed. Keep an eye on them behind me, will you? Yeah. This one. Oh, easy, easy. He's still got a lot of fight in him. So I'm gonna have to be careful because he's they're covered in spines. Relax. Relax. Give him another minute to calm down. There you go. All along the top are all spikes. See them teeth in there? Right. He is a lovely olive green, isn't he? No cracker. See how well camouflaged he's been the seaweed. Let's get him unhooked, get a photo and get him back. Oh, he's mangled that hook. <laughs> I'm gonna have to change the hook now. Oh, oh there's one. I hope you saw that bite there behind me. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I hope you saw that bite going on there. And he, even, he isn't even a big one. But he's... He is beautiful, this one. Look how spotty he is. I don't know if you can see up there on his dorsal, but all of those spots are bright blue. What a beautiful looking fish. Hooks just popped straight out. Yeah, these are their teeth. For pulling. For pulling like limpets and mussels and cockles and all that bits and bobs off the rocks. So they need really strong little teeth. They've just got like proper little little gnashes. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy. This is a sign. Like I said, as we're coming up to high water, we're an hour away from high water now. The fish have started coming in. The bigger fish have moved in on the feed. Let's get these two. <laughs> They're stunners. But considering that these are the same species, these are exactly the same species. You couldn't get more different as far as their colours, could you? Yeah, look. And especially when you when you look underneath, this guy's just like a, a golden green, and this guy here. Let's get him back down to the water before they before they cause any more havoc. I found that reason why that pipit keeps going mad. We are getting an awful lot of bites, but it's, I think it is the smaller wrasse. 
So what I'm doing is I'm putting like a real big bunch of bait on just to try and like I'm imagining this it's all about trying to envisage what's going on on the seabed from what the signs are telling you. And I'm seeing loads and loads of little tiny bites. And I know by their behavior that any commotion that's caused by a fish, a ras, or I know this because when I'm, when I'm diving and if I'm pulling rocks around, there's ras in there right with me. So anytime there's any disturbance, they're straight in there. So I'm thinking if by putting a lot of bait on, a lot of worms on, the little fish will be picking at it. The big fish will see this and then he'll, they'll hone in. Now, hopefully there will be enough bait left on the hook when the big fish sees it to bite it. We'll see. But yeah, I'm really pleased with them too. Nothing for ages and then tow straight away like that. Usually with a big one, there's no messing about. I mean, I hope you saw that last one over my shoulder. The rod was just... And the other one, <laughs> the, other one the, the whole tripod was nearly gone. Pretty one. Do I start carrying on now? Another nice, nice little red and white spotty one. It's not hard to see where they get all that power from, is there? Just look at how much surface area is there. There, there, and there. Let's get him dropped back. Looking brown one. He's been in the wars a bit, he's got a couple of scars on him, this guy. Right, I've just had a fish on there. Took me straight into a snag. I worked around for a little bit and it snapped the lead off. But I got the rig back, so all I need to do is tie on another lead. That's why you use that rotten bomb. All I've lost there is a lead. I haven't lost a rig, I don't have to tie a new rig. All I'll do is just tie a lead on, put some more bait on, cast straight back out. That's why I was using that canny link and that rotten bottom. Twice now I've missed fishing that same spot. Lost the fishing there in a minute going to a snag. It must be like a bit of a cave because I could feel the line grating as it went underneath. That's why you really need to be on top of them. Another nice little green one. Not the big one though. I have, I have had the hook in it once and it is a big fish, but I just can't see what's going on there. Oh, come on. <laughs> oh. Always with that one last cast. I said to myself, I was like, yeah, last little bit of bait, last cast. It's not a four pounder, but I tell you what, it's a nice looking fish. Cracking, <laughs> cracking fish. And I think I'm going to end on that. One reason, because we're right bang on high tide now. Second reason, because I've been here all day. And the third reason, because that pipit's going mad still. And I'm not going to stick around here much longer. She, she wants to be on her nest. She doesn't want me around here. So yeah, perfect way to end.
I hope you enjoyed joining me. I hope you found it interesting. All the very best. See you later. And one more little one just as I've packed up. <laughs>